So first I want to recognize legislators and elected officials who are here with us today. Of course we have Representative Jared Patterson, Representative Brian Harrison, and Chief Justice Jim Wortham are here with us. Thank you for being here. Today's a good day to talk about energy, as I mentioned, because we're all very thankful that the lights are on and that the heat is keeping us warm. But do you ever think about energy that much? I mean, that's kind of the point, right, is that it's always on, it's very consistent. It used to be a lot easier to measure. One unit of horsepower, for example, took one horse. Yep. It's gotten a lot more complicated than that. So thankfully, we have a speaker here this morning that's going to break it down for us. There's pretty much no one more qualified more knowledgeable and frankly more engaging on the issue of power density. If that's a word that's unfamiliar for most of you, that's why we're going to have our speaker come up here and talk about it because it's very, very important to understand how the lights stay on and, and particularly in terms of public policy and crafting energy policy is very important. Robert Bryce is going to be our speaker this morning. He's a, he's a Texas-based author, journalist, podcaster, film producer, public speaker. Robert's work has appeared in everything from the Wall Street Journal to Field and Stream. Please help me welcome Robert Bryce to the stage. Thank you, sir. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, okay, all right. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Jumping the, jump the gun here. There we go. I'm gonna talk about power density this morning. We don't care about energy. In fact, we don't give a damn about energy. I'll gladly put french fries or milkshakes or orange juice in the fuel tank of my truck if when I press the accelerator, I think it's going to give me the motive power that I want. I don't care how the uh, lighting power or uh, amplification power, electric power in this room is being generated. I, I don't care about what fuel it is, I care that the energy is flowing and that we can use it. Energy and power are not the same things. They are frequently confused, and if you remember nothing else, remember this. Energy and power are not the same thing. Energy is the ability to do work. Power is the rate at which work gets done. Energy is a sum. Energy is a gallon of gasoline. Energy is a thousand barrels of oil. Power is a rate. Rates are more telling than sums. We're in Texas. You could have a million barrels of oil in the ground. It's not worth anything. It's worth effectively nothing unless you can make it flow. Energy flow is what power is. We have to make energy flow, and if we can't make it flow, it isn't worth anything to us. Rates are more telling than sums. So why do we care about power? Because the more power we have, the more work we can do. Power is the rate at which work gets done. A, an oil well that produces 10 barrels of oil per day, per day, right, because that's a rate. It's energy over time. One joule per second equals one watt. A well that produces 10 barrels of oil per day is 10 times as powerful as a well that produces one barrel per day. Okay, so power density, what is power density? It's a measure of the rate of energy flow that can be harnessed or generated from a given volume, area, or mass. This is the physics class that you should have had in high school and didn't. You have volumetric power density, which is watts per cubic meter, aerial power density, also sometimes called surface power density, which is uh, watts per square meter, which is my focus today, and then gravimetric power density, which is watts per kilogram. Okay, so now you know what power density is. Well, why does it matter? Because it determines the shape and the size of our energy and power networks. So what is the iron law of power density? In preparing for this talk, and I was flattered to be invited, I thought, okay, I've got to boil this entire physics class down to 10 minutes. What is the iron law of power density? It is the lower the power density, the higher the resource intensity. When you start with a system that has low power density, you have to add other inputs. Steel, concrete, land, fertilizer, copper. That's a problem because now what we are, this, the, the, 
the, the meme of the moment, and there is a tremendous amount of momentum behind this all-renewable push, this electrify-everything push, all designed to move our systems, our energy and power systems, from high power density sources that are reliable and dispatchable to low power density sources that are not dispatchable and unreliable. I'd call it crazy, but it'd be an insult to the insane. <laughs> okay, so why do we care about our, the uh, power density and how to, a, a demonstration of the iron law of power density is looking at the iron law of power density in corn ethanol. Last year, Bloomberg did a great, report, a, a great piece, Dave Merrill did, pu published it last June. The land area footprint of corn ethanol is, is equal to two-thirds of all the land in the United States devoted to energy production is taken up by the corn ethanol scam. An air, land area larger than the state of Nebraska. Well, why is that? It's because the, the aerial power density in watts per square meter of corn ethanol is about one-tenth of a watt per square meter. Wind energy, I don't care where you put it, onshore, offshore, you're going to hear from Bonnie Brady and Megan Lapp later today. They're experts on offshore wind and ardent opponents, as am I. I don't care where you put your wind turbine, the power density is one watt per square meter, period. Elvis has left the building. Solar is better, 10 watts per square meter, but there are no, there are no competition for natural gas and nuclear. On a Marcellus shale, uh, shale gas pad, this data is from the Bureau of Economic Geology, thanks to Scott Tinker for giving this, this data, 1,900 watts per square meter. And that's after the gas produced from those shale gas wells is put through a combined cycle gas turbine with 35% efficiency. What we're seeing today in the oil and gas business is a shrinking of their footprints because it makes more economic sense. It also makes environmental sense. At the same time, the oil and gas industry is shrinking its footprint and doing multi-well multi pads because it makes more economic sense to have a smaller footprint. The, oil, the wind and solar industries are spreading out all across the countryside and they're meeting resistance left and right. The nuclear uh, industry, 2,000 watts per square meter. Why do we care about nuclear? Because the power density is unsurpassed and will never be surpassed by any other uh, energy or power source that we know of uh, today. The 2,000 watts per square meter is from the Indian Point nuclear plant in Buchanan, New York, which was criminally, prematurely shuttered in April of last year. Thanks to Governor Andrew Cuomo. See you later, you sorry bastard. <laughs> and, from pressure, and from pressure from the Natural Resources Defense Council. What replaced the nuclear power plant? Gas-fired generation and higher emissions in a state that wants to be a climate leader. Okay, so what's the other example of the iron law of power density? It's the wind energy business. I'm a longtime critic. Those people don't like me. I don't like them back. <laughs> to meet existing electricity demand in the United States, roughly 4,000 terawatt hours per year, with wind energy alone, you would need a land area of 900,000 square kilometers, roughly 350,000 square miles. It's twice the size of the state of California, which is interesting because you cannot build onshore wind in California. The local opposition is so great. Can't build it in New York, can't build it in Vermont either. All across the country, local communities are rejecting or restricting wind energy. You won't read about this in the New York Times, even though New York State is arguably the epicenter of the backlash against the wind business. This is a graphic I created. I've been following this for now seven years, documenting the, the rejections and restrictions of wind. They're happening from Maine to Hawaii. Latest count, 323 rejections in the United States since 2015. These numbers have never been, never been challenged by the wind industry, by the way, because they don't want to talk about these rejections. And these aren't being uh, you know, somehow uh, orchestrated by some national environmental groups. These are local people, a lot of them farmers, rural Americans, who are, are fighting to protect their neighborhoods, and damn well they should. Okay, so the iron law of power density and critical minerals, this is a key issue, ladies and gentlemen. I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal last month talking about this issue. The lower the power density, the higher the resource intensity. Look in, this is a screen grab from the International Energy Agency's report on critical minerals in May. I didn't make this graphic. It is, it, it's the IEA graphic. Look at offshore wind. Look at the critical mineral intensity of offshore wind. The newest offshore wind turbines require three tons of rare earth elements. Compare that 
to nuclear, coal, and natural gas. Far fewer inputs, why? The iron law of power density. The lower the power density, the higher the resource intensity. Okay, so who dominates critical minerals processing? China. Again, this is a screen grab from the International Energy Agency's report in May, and yet we hear nothing about this effectively from the Biden administration. Promotion of electric vehicles in their, their big rollout last month, not a single word in the, in the White House press release about rare earth elements. China dominates this industry, and they're consolidating their dominance. So what's the way forward? Natural gas to nuclear. I've been promoting this now for more than a dozen years. Why? High aerial power density, small footprints. I'm opposed to the wind industry for a lot of reasons. One is I'm an avid bird watcher, have been for 30 years. We're sacrificing our wildlife, our birds and our bats for this idea about so-called clean energy, clean power. It's a fiction. Thank you, thank you. Small footprints, affordable, low carbon, no carbon, uh, and the U.S. should lead in both. The Chinese and the Russians are stealing a march on us when it comes to nuclear power. This is the advertising portion of the program. It's going to last 30 seconds. I have a new film out. I have uh, some great supporters here in the room. Chris Wright, Bud Brigham helped me produce this film. I went to India, Iceland, Lebanon, Puerto Rico, looking at the world through the lens of electricity. You can watch it on all the major streaming platforms. It's free on the Roku channel. I have six books, six, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, you don't have to read it. You just have to buy it. <laughs> and if you buy it on your Kindle, I make a better royalty. Finally, I'm a podcaster. I've had Chris Wright on my podcast. You're going to hear from Chris in a little bit. Uh, uh, I've had uh, Bjorn Lomberg, Michael Schellenberger, Daniel Jurgen, uh, and have great fun. And it is free. Uh, finally, I'm easy to find. I'm on the Google. Power density matters, ladies and gentlemen. It is the reason why our energy and power systems are the way they are. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I hope everybody was paying attention and taking notes because in order to get lunch, we're going to have a quiz and you have to make at least a B plus on your physics quiz in order to get lunch. <coughs> um, I'm going to introduce our moderator for our next, for our next panel. Um, you know, we have a saying at TPPF that the reward for good work is more work. And there's no one deserving of more work than the moderator of our next panel. Excuse me. Rob Henneke leads our litigation center, our Center for American Future. And you might know him from whether it's protecting our liberties from the tiny tyrants of local governments all the way up to fighting Obamacare at the Supreme Court to most recently our historic win, ours as a team, our historic win at the Supreme Court uh, blocking the Biden vax mandate against businesses. So please help me welcome Rob Henneke. Good morning. Good morning. Um, that was a comms introduction. I love it. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome again to the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I went to law school. I didn't go to math school. Uh, but as you can tell, there's only three of us up here right now. Uh, we, uh, we learned yesterday that, uh, that General Paxton is not feeling well, uh, but he's joining us via video once we can figure out the technical difficulties, so, uh, so stay tuned, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have him jump in here soon. But that just gives me the opportunity to have a great discussion with really our honored guest here today. And the idea of today's panel was to have a discussion really highlighting the extraordinary work that the conservative state attorney generals are doing and championing and leading the fight for liberty. And really, my great honor and opportunity to introduce to you two of really the national rock stars that are fighting every day to defend our constitutional rights and winning those fights. And so I have with me here today uh, uh, great friends of mine, but the Attorney General from the state of Arkansas, Leslie Rutledge, and Whew. 
uh, the Attorney General from uh, the state of Utah, Sean Reyes. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce both and we'll get started. Uh, starting first, uh, Sean here with us is the 21st uh, Attorney General in the state of Utah. You all might, uh, I use y'all. I uh, recognize him from giving one of the closing night speeches at the uh, Republican National Convention here, here recently. Did an amazing job, Sean. Thanks. Uh, he graduated uh, uh, summa cum laude from Brigham Young University. And I have to mention this, not only did he receive his law degree from UC Berkeley, but you played varsity volleyball for the Cal Golden Bears yeah. at the same time. So many pounds ago, brother. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, Sean and his wife uh, have been married for 20, 25 years and uh, proud parents of six beautiful, amazing children, I understand. Yeah. So, Sean, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with me also is uh, the Attorney General for Arkansas, Gen General Leslie Rutledge, who is the 56th Attorney General of the state of Arkansas, uh, has also served in that role since 2014. Uh, double graduate of the University of Arkansas, undergrad and law degree, uh, and uh, you know, I know you live on, you have a farm in Crittenden County, so not only uh, fighting for liberty, but also uh, providing for uh, the food source for America, uh, where you live with your husband, Boyce, and you all have one daughter, so it's so great to have you with us here today. I thought with both of you how I wanted to, to start off and, and trying to frame this perspective, it, it's really unique that both of you, uh, General Rutledge, General Reyes, and General Paxton were all elected in 2014, uh, I think, first took office then. And so there's been so much transition, but you three are really the veterans of the state fight for liberty against the oppressive federal government, where it started with the Obama administration. Uh, my goodness, doesn't that seem kind of tame now? Uh, and then carrying <laughs> forward uh, through here today. And General Rutledge, let me start with you with framing that and asking kind of your to put that in perspective and your takeaways as far as lessons that you learned during the Obama administration and how those are being applied here today. Well, certainly, and thank you, Rob, and thank you to the Texas Public Policy Foundation for inviting this Arkansas Razorback <laughs> to join you today. I didn't sleep well because I thought that Texas Longhorn was gonna come out off the robe in my closet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband would be ashamed that I even put it on, but uh, I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness when I get home. But it, it, it is good to be uh, in the state of Texas with all these awesome conservatives, so good morning. Uh, yes, when uh, Ken and Sean and I first took office in 2014, we, you know, I would tell people in Arkansas, and I'm sure they would tell folks in Texas and Utah, that we were going to wake up every day and ask ourselves, how are we going to sue Barack Obama today? And we sure did. And we had victories, whether it was over the so-called Clean Power Plan, the Department of Labor's overtime rule, waters of the U.S., all these things that significantly impact you all as business leaders, but also as families. But now we yearn for those days because Joe Biden and the, I refer to it as the Harris-Biden administration. Fair. We know who's calling the shots. But the Biden-Harris administration has made the Obama-Biden administration look as if it was a 45 record played in 30. The rate at which this president is signing illegal orders and the rate at which we are having to file those lawsuits. Already Arkansas alone has filed nearly 70 legal actions. I'm sure Utah is right there, and because of the, uh, prox the relationship to Texas, to the southern border with Mexico, you all have many more lawsuits. And that's a testament to your Attorney General, our good friend Ken Paxton. Sean, looking back from the beginning of your tenure as the Attorney General, carrying those lessons forward here today, uh, what is your kind of takeaway, and and how is that informing what you're doing now? 
Thanks, Rob. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with you, and thank you so much for what you do, for standing up for conservative values and principles. Please keep it up. You do make a difference, and we feel the impact of the decisions that you make everywhere across the country, including um, back in Utah, so thank you. Um, I also, Rob, before I answer the, the question, need to just tell you what a privilege it is to work with incredible public servants like General Rutledge and your Attorney General, Ken Paxton. I love the presentation by Mr. Bryce, by the way, great job. I don't know much about corn ethanol or wind rejections, but I can tell you this, when it comes to, ladies and gentlemen, standing up for liberties and freedoms and protecting families and life and all of the other important constitutional issues in the state, of Arkansas, and certainly in the state of Texas, y'all have some power density that is off the charts mm -hmm. because of these attorneys general that, right. that are serving. Yeah, no, absolutely. They've both, Leslie and Ken, have both uh, led our Republican attorney general coalition, past chairs, uh, difficult while they're managing their own states but to inspire all of the states to come together. We're powerful alone, but so much more when we work together. And just like General Rutledge said, since the time of President Obama, and now back it seems like a, a bad, um, you know, Groundhog Day uh, movie uh, episode. Uh, we, we see our friend uh, um, Joe Biden again, and it is, uh, it is comforting to, to be able to work with people like them, who have such integrity, but also substance, and are so passionate, they could be making a lot more money and having a lot more fun doing other jobs. It's not fun waking up in the morning and being ridiculed and, and criticized by the cancel culture, the woke uh, media, and have death threats hurled at you and your family. Um, I mentioned that there were public servants, and I just want to leave this with you, and then if I have time, I'll, I'll answer the question. Very, <laughs> very political thing to do. Um, I, I use the word public servants, not politicians, for a reason, because anybody know the definition of politics, by the way? I, I was an English major, so I love the etymologies of linguistics. There are actually two cognates. Poly is the first part of the word, which means, anybody? Many. Many, thank you gold star for the table four, many, and then the second part of the word politics is ticks, little blood-sucking insects, and when you put the two together, you have the definition of politics, and politicians, like the ones that we have in the White House, are the embodiment of that selfishness, because politicians ask the question, what can a particular position or office do for me? How does it serve my agenda and my interests? Public servants like Leslie Rutledge and Ken Paxton asked the opposite question, which is, what can I do to serve the office and the people that it represents? And I am telling you, again, and this is not a commercial for Ken, uh, although we wouldn't be here without his invitation um, and the uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, these guys are incredible public servants who every day ask the question, what can I do to serve the great people of Texas and Arkansas. And so um, I know we have a lot of uh, discussion today about the Obama, or excuse me, the Biden uh, agenda. Uh, you know. Same thing, <laughs> right. um, but, but worse. Um, and and, and I, I will say the perspectives, the, the musicians might change, but the music is still the same. And we're just as committed today as we were when we first took office with a lot more experience now um, with talented staff uh, that we have in our office, uh, very uh, capable lawyers. And uh, today marks the first day of the Joe Biden one-year anniversary mark. And we'll talk about a hundred different topics, I hope, uh, in the short time that we have. But I do want to point out one area, which I, I th would never think I'd say this, um, having lived during the Jimmy Carter administration. Um, I think we have uh, Joe Biden has managed somehow to accomplish uh, the worst foreign policy for a U.S. president in the history of our country in only one year. And <laughs> thank goodness for all of you standing up and calling him out on it. We certainly have 
uh, as state AGs. Um, so we're, we're excited to continue the fight and uh, glad that we still have uh, General Paxton and General Rutledge um, to man the battleships. Texas, how Texas goes, ladies and gentlemen, is how America goes in terms of what values and what matters most to us. And so we have to make sure that we have people manning the battleship that Texas is on the legal front. And uh, I see he's now joining us, uh, our, our good colleague, Ken. Hope you're feeling better. Our prayers with you and Angela and the family. But um, maybe, Rob, I'll turn the mic back over so, so they can hear from General Paxton. Yeah, good morning, General. It's, it's uh, great to see you virtually. We miss you. We know you're not uh, feeling well. And, and first of all, uh, we're praying for a speedy recovery uh, for you, for, for recovered health for your family. And just also want to thank you that you're not missing a beat. I know you're working hard for Texas, and, and thank you for making the effort to join us uh, here today. Uh, wish you could be in person, but we can't wait to have you back to TPPF. But, uh, We've got your friends, General Rutledge and Reyes, here with us and uh, kicking it off. Um, so, uh, you know, let me first of all just make sure that you can hear me, uh, Ken, and, and uh, you know, everyone here knows the amazing job you're doing for the state of Texas, the, the work that you've been doing and leading your agency and, and the 4,000 employees that you have, the 30,000 cases a year that your office handles. Uh, and taking on everything from uh, consumer fraud to, to defending the state of Texas against lawsuits, and every now and then you, you sue Biden. So uh, let me just get a chance. For everybody, welcome Ken Paxton to join us. Well, hey, Rob. Let me just say thank you for uh, having me. I am so grateful for the Texas Public Policy Foundation for what you all have done. I've worked very closely with TPPF since 2003, and I truly love the organization. I, I love the people involved, and I'm really sad that I'm not there. This has been not the way I planned my week, um, but I am so grateful for my uh, friends, uh, Sean and Leslie, two, two of the greatest AGs in the country, and also just two of my closest friends, and, and I, I so appreciate them showing up and, and speaking They've been doing that uh, since I've been in office. Leslie came in with me, I think Sean a year before me, and they've continued the fight, and, and Leslie's gonna continue the fight in, a, in another place uh, as Lieutenant Governor of Arkansas. And I just wanna say how much I miss being there. And, and it truly is, I think, a, a time for us to unite uh, as, 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 a, as a nation and as Attorney Generals, because we're, I truly believe we're in a fight for, for our freedom, for our lives. And, and the 27 lawsuits that Texas filed against Biden in my 27, uh, in my first 27 months, actually pales in comparison to what we're fighting now. It's, it's twice as aggressive, at least. Uh, there's a complete disregard for the Constitution. There's a complete disregard for federal law. There's a disregard for states' rights. There's a disregard for even court orders that come from the US Supreme Court. And, and one example is the Remain in Mexico program where we have fought and won over and over all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And then the Biden administration just ignores the court orders and they implement, but just barely a couple hundred people a month instead of dealing with the almost 200,000 people a month crossing the border. And then of course we have the vaccine mandates and, and other fights with the Biden administration. I think the AGs are gonna play a crucial role. I truly believe Texas is gonna play a crucial role and if we don't play that role right now, if we're not all standing up right now, I'm convinced that we are gonna lose our country and it's happening right in front of our eyes and it's happening fast. So thank you for letting me be a part of this, even though I'm not there in person. And again, thank you so much for my, to my friends who have showed up to, to, to speak with me. Stay with you for a moment and drill into a point that you just made. I, it was extraordinary during whatever that event was yesterday, that two hour uh, infomercial press conference or whatever at the White House with, with, uh, with Biden, <laughs> there wasn't a single time that President Biden was asked about border security or immigration policy. And Ken, I, I know this has been a focus of your team. You've been many times to the southern border. You're leading the Texas efforts to fight the, the out of control uh, 
border crisis and secure the border with your team. Can you just give us a quick update on, it's kind of off script, but it's so important to this room, an update on where things stand and where Texas is in the fight uh, to defend the state? So from literally day one, Joe Biden stepped out and said he was no longer enforcing deportations, which is completely in violation of federal law. Uh, I think we sued him on day three, which is the fastest anybody, any president's ever been sued by a state that I know of. And by day six, we had our first injunction. Unfortunately, that, that didn't slow him down. We, we've sued him now seven times over immigration. We have not lost yet. Uh, we've continued to, to fight on forcing him to build a wall and use the money that was appropriated. We've, we've tried to enforce Title 42, where he's supposed to keep people out because of medical reasons. We've, of course, I just talked about the Remain in Mexico program. I've been down to the border, uh, all the way along the border several times. I'm going back down with, uh, I believe both Sean and Leslie are going with me and about uh, 10 other Republican AGs next week with Maria Bartiroma. And, and the reason I keep going back is to highlight, and keep trying to make or allow Americans to see how bad it is and what the consequences of this are. Because the reality is, if you think about this, I mean, we're, we're, we're allowing in almost 200,000 people a month. They come in with COVID a high percentage of them. They're spread all over the country with COVID, which means that people are dying because of this. Drug overdoses are up over 30% because of fentanyl and, and because the border agents cannot control now the control, the, the spread of, of, of drugs because they're so focused on the logistics of, of dealing with the hundreds of thousands of people crossing the border. Uh, border agent deaths are up, I believe, 275% because they are exposed to COVID in, in ways that they otherwise would, would not be. And of course, just dealing with the people along the border, whatever their, their life is, whether they're ranchers or whether they're just people living along the border, whether they're just trying to do their business, they're frustrated, they're scared, they're, their property values are being devalued because people don't want to stay on the border, they're afraid. Uh, the cartels are gaining, uh, gaining tremendous strength. Uh, the Biden administration realizes how much money they're making off of charging every single person and I can tell you, I've met these people across the border. I've talked to them and asked them, like, we, we stopped this group of four. And we asked them how much they would paid the cartels. And they said $8,000 a person. That's, that's about average. So these cartels are making billions of dollars. The Biden administration is aiding in their human trafficking. And they're aiding in their drug trafficking. The Chinese are making billions of dollars because they're making a lot of these drugs. So this is a huge catastrophic event that's going to have long-term implications. And the reality is, I believe it's purposeful. It's not an accident. This is a, a man-made crisis by Joe Biden. And the goal is to get as many illegals in Republican states as possible for two reasons. One is for votes, because look, they're trying to am give amnesty. Every, they're gonna be trying to get am amnesty from here on out. And then two, it causes really negative effects for Republican states. We are so successful. Whatever Republican state you look at, we're successful because we have low taxes. We have opportunity for people. And by creating this crisis and bringing people in that we have to pay for and deal with the downside of, the social costs of, it hurts Republican states. And I know that's a very cynical view of the president, but when you look at what he's doing, it's no accident. It is exactly, they are getting exactly what they want. And even though people go, he must not know what he's doing, he may not, but his administration does. <clears throat> Well, uh, let's pull back uh, General Rutledge, General Reyes, and look at this perspective from, from your states. And, and highlighting two areas that I know have been priorities of you specifically, um, Leslie, I know part of your accomplishments as, as Arkansas Attorney General has been in dealing with the opioid crisis, which is exacerbated by the, the situation at the border. But share with us your, your perspective of this and specifically how you're having to deal with this in your state uh, and the consequences of the failed border policies of the Biden administration. Well, sure, and I think, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, I'll be coming down next week uh, to join uh, Ken and Sean and others uh, at the border. I'm gonna be driving down. <laughs> That's how close Arkansas is. And for folks in my home state to understand the, the crisis that we have when we look at uh, the opioid crisis, as Rob mentioned, being uh, exacerbated, I'm gonna use his word, and fueled by the cartels because of illegal fentanyl being trafficked up through the southern border. That impacts 
the overdose rates, it impacts our workforce, it impacts our education, our economy, everything is negatively impacted because of the open border policies of the Biden administration. But for the state of Texas, using the resources and other states like Arkansas, adding resources, we would not have as secure of a border as we have, but for the great states of Texas, Arkansas, Utah, and others for putting the necessary state resources behind it. It impacts all of our families. Thank you. While we have sued successfully drug manufacturers for their role in the opioid crisis, we've put millions of dollars uh, back into our states, into programs for education, law enforcement. When you bowl all the water out, we have to stop the influx of fentanyl and illegal drugs, even illegal prescription drugs, from entering into our communities. Vaping, it seemed as though vaping People seem to have forgotten about it. It's still prevalent. And when you talk to the Drug Enforcement Administration and the agents, they will tell you that when they make a stop on one of our major interstates, Arkansas has I-30 and I-40 going straight across it, they will pick up somewhere around 40 to 50,000 vape pens along with the fentanyl, cocaine, other illegal drugs because that's a method that is now being used for young people and others to ingest illegal fentanyl and others. Thank you. General Reyes, I, I, I know that, that fighting human trafficking has been a particular priority of yours and it ties into this discussion, but, but pulling back to the, the state of Utah, what does this look like in your state or what is your viewpoint of this and how are y'all affected? Yeah, well, I made a comment um, that some deemed uh, controversial or sensational and the comment was, Every state is a border state these days because while we're not physically contiguous to the southern border, all of what you all are dealing with is coming up and the same types of problems we see every single day. And I think General Paxson and Rutledge did a great job at outlining um, many of the impacts. One uh, that we have to deal with are the amount of deaths that we have that we see from fentanyl or carfentanyl laced drugs is increasing exponentially and there are enough drugs pouring in from the south to kill our entire nation many times over. It is that serious, it is that sobering. And just like General Rutledge said, thank goodness that we have you all here putting the resources and paying attention to this issue and bringing light to the problems that are happening because far too many Americans are dying every single day. You realize that these types of overdose deaths from these types of drugs are greater in America than other killers like breast cancer, car accidents. And if you look at the amount of deaths over the last decade plus in America, it is the single greatest um, killer. I mean, it is unbelievable. So many different ways to look at it. More deaths in America during that amount of time or even in one single year to drug overdoses than all of the lives lost during the Vietnam conflict could give you a hundred more examples. So thank goodness that we have people like uh, General Pax and General Rutledge helping us. I won't be driving down because for me it is not uh, a convenient drive. Nevertheless, uh, I think the point is that we all have to be working on this because um, the open border policy that we have in the Biden administration is allowing drugs and human trafficking to proliferate. So often those two things are intertwined. I know many of you, you prosecuted at the county level. I think my friend Brett Tolman's in here who prosecuted in Utah at the federal level and we at the state level. Um, you often can't um, untangle those uh, human trafficking cases. Traffickers, they'll, they'll traffic uh, they'll little boys and girls in. Uh, they'll sell them, force them to mule their drugs or distribute their drugs. And uh, it, it is an, a clear and present danger and an epidemic uh, truly in our, in our nation. Thank you for how th strong all three of y'all have been on this and, and fighting every day to, to secure our border. I really commend uh, y'all's work in this area. Uh, General Paxton, I'm gonna ask all three of you this question, so I'll, I'll set it up. And it's admittedly kind of an unfair question, 
Uh, I tried in preparing for this to figure out how many lawsuits conservative state attorney generals had filed against the Biden administration over the last year and how many lawsuits y'all have won. And, and I gave up. I can't figure out. It's, it's a big number. Um, but I wanted to ask each of you three, of the wins over the last year, which you would highlight as the biggest win and why? And that's why it's unfair because y'all have done so much, but hopefully to highlight for this room the significant accomplishments by unfairly forcing y'all to, to drill down on one uh, to, to raise that up and highlight for this room. So, General Paxton, let me start with so you. So he'll take the first seven, Leslie will do the next seven. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Well, Rob, it won't be the first unfair question I've been asked. Uh, I'd say we, I think we're in 26 lawsuits now with the Biden administration, and we've got a 92% win rate. So wow. it's, been, it's been remarkable, yeah. And I know, you know we got some tough cases ahead of us. And maybe it's so hard to choose between whether the Remain in Mexico program or the, the OSHA vaccine mandate case was, was the biggest win. I'm gonna talk about, since I've not talked about the vaccine mandate and why that was so important. That was a case that we filed and we got the first uh, nationwide injunction against the vaccine mandate for employers over 100. And the reason that was so important to me is it's, it protected people. It protected people's choice. And had, they, had, we, got, had we not gotten the, the, the initial stay, people would have been forced and a lot of them would have quit their jobs. And, and, and obviously that has a tremendous impact on people's lives, choosing between their health and their jobs. And so when we got that ultimate victory from the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, I think I felt very satisfied with that victory because I knew that, that so many people uh, had to make such a tough decision about health and job and some would have made the different decisions. And, and so I, I'm, and it also matters to me because I realized that if the federal government through the Biden administration, through the, through the president can order you as an individual to make a choice and tell an employer okay, you've got to fire that person if they don't get a vaccine, then there's really nothing that the Constitution protects us from. They can literally order us to do anything. And so winning that fight was, was I think, really important. I, I am disappointed in what the, the, the Supreme Court did with healthcare workers. I think they got it wrong for, for the very same reasons that, people, that the federal government doesn't have that power to tell individuals that they have to get a, a, a vaccine or lose their job. So Rob, if you gave me a choice, I'd, I'd, I'd have to say both the Remain in Mexico program, which I talked about, and the, and the vaccine mandate case so far have been our, our biggest wins. Awesome. Congratulations, General. <laughs> General Reyes, uh, what, what other signature win do you see from, from last year that you can, you can share with our room? Yeah, again, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, I did a recent Lincoln Day dinner where I was supposed to do a summary of all of the cases that we've filed and won, and I realized after my time had passed that I'd only made it through half <laughs> of the, the cases. Wow. So m maybe pandering a little bit um, here to this particular audience. I know a lot of great Americans here from the Odessa Midland area know how important Whoa. energy is. Yeah, oh, you can make some noise. Go ahead. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, one of the cases that we won earlier um, in the year uh, was a moratorium that the Biden administration tried to place on oil and gas drilling in public lands. And in states like Utah, where uh, two thirds of our state are dominated by the federal government and public lands, and, uh, and, and monuments are designated the size of Delaware and sweeping you know, multi-million uh, acre chunks, um, it was a, a very important case um, that we banded together filed against the Biden administration and won and got an injunction against the Biden administration um, and uh, made sure that uh, the, the moratorium never went into place so the, uh, the good men and women in our energy industry could continue to, to put their um, you know, hats on and, uh, and get to work every single day and provide for their families. That is one, uh, again, of dozens, um, but I thought maybe uh, give a little perspective that we do stand up together uh, for energy and General Paxton has done an incredible job uh, not just for Texas but for America in terms of energy independence 
and the Biden administration has given away so many of those wins in, in a mere year. We're, uh, that's a great one to highlight, Sean. We're, I mean, we still feel the pinch of the pump, but really without your efforts and, and your, your teams and the other states working together, I think it'd be worse. So. Yeah, I think those account for about a quarter uh, nationally in terms of uh, all of the production, those, those, those public lands. So thank you. Thanks, yeah. Rob. Appreciate thank it. you. Congratulations. General Rutledge, Thanks. what's left? Well, I think, you know, Ken touching on the, the OSHA lawsuit that was huge, Sean talking about the uh, moratorium, but it's also important not just the cases that we've taken up to the Supreme Court, but some of the illegal actions that we're stopping even in our own states. Uh, critical race theory. Many of the AGs, uh, one of the issues that the Biden administration, Department of Education, was going to put a requirement uh, in order for grants to be available to have critical race theory taught. Well, immediately we jumped up as a group and sent message to the Biden administration that it was illegal. They took that requirement down. That was a huge win. In the state of Arkansas, I was asked for an opinion on whether or not critical race theory violates the law in Arkansas. You bet it does. Good. We will not teach critical race theory in Arkansas. <laughs> so we were part of those uh, same lawsuits with OSHA. I think that's uh, important to Ken's point. Uh, we are very disappointed for our healthcare workers because when you force someone to have to decide whether or not to get a shot or lose their job, you're taking away their freedoms. You're taking away their freedom to work. And obviously, these dyed in the wool bureaucrats that are sewn into the carpet of these federal agencies, they don't know how hard it is to find good, hardworking, honest people to come to work every day. That's right. Because it doesn't matter if it's Austin, Dallas, Salt Lake City or Little Rock, you can stand on any street and see help wanted signs. People are desperate for good employees and the last thing they want to do is to tell their employees that they have to do something about their health care that they don't believe they should do. We also must defend our religious liberty rights. All three of us have been advocates for defending the religious liberty rights of people across America, and particularly on school choice, whether it was the case in Montana to ensure that tax credits were given to religious schools the same as they would any other. So while we can talk about these large issues, it's about freedoms, and we have a federal administration that does not respect your individual freedoms to live your life and to run your business and to support your families. But I can guarantee you, you have three AGs here and 20 plus something AGs across the country that are fighting every single day for all of you. Thank you, thank you. Well, since Leslie, you brought up, you brought up CRT. Can you talk for just a second about when uh, General Garland um, issued his uh, edict that he was going to send federal enforcement uh, for parents? Because um, we all jumped in together again, and I think that's a significant part of that. Well, it is, and, and we saw and we heard last night, I mean, that's why we have Governor Glenn Youngkin in the state of Virginia. It's because we had an out-of-control Department of Justice under what could have been U.S. Supreme Court Justice Merrick Garland. Mm. Let's just rewind a couple of years and think <laughs> about that. Um, who was willing to send federal agents into your hometowns to tell your school boards what they can and cannot teach. Treat us like domestic terrorists. Right. As parents who are concerned about our children's education. Unbelievable. Well, and let me add, Rob, that that's actually happening in South Lake right now. The, the, uh, the school board there uh, elected conservative members to, to end CRT and to deal with other issues. And that school board now is supposedly being investigated 
by the uh, FBI and the Department of Justice. So they have, they are doing this. Uh, it's the first time in my life that I felt like we were living in, you know, something like Germany was in the early 30s. When you have a federal government that is willing to tell parents that um, they can't speak out on certain issues or they're going to be investigated and that the FBI is going to potentially bring uh, the Department of Justice potentially going to prosecute them. It's, it's unheard of in this country, but it is happening now. And that's why it's so important. When I speak, I tell parents they have to speak out because if they're afraid now, it's just going to get worse. And if we all speak out now, we're, we're large enough that we can stop them. This has been an incredible discussion, and, and we just have a, a, a few more minutes. So I have one more question that I have for you three, and then, and then I'll have a, a question in closing. But General Paxton, to start with you, uh, recently, and, and General Rutledge, you mentioned this, the, the win in Virginia, but it wasn't just Governor Youngkin. It was also elected uh, a new Attorney General, Jason Miaris, who uh, is the newest Republican AG, seems to be off to a great start. Let me ask each of you three, though, as kind of framing the future for you have now another player on the team. What advice would you give for him in standing up his office and, and jumping into the fight that, uh, that you could share with the room on, on how he should be uh, you know, starting and, and how he could be adding to the success that y'all have built on? Ken, can I start with oh, you? Okay. Yeah, so I think first I'd tell them to, to call people like Leslie and Sean. Uh, I think you go, to, you go to people that have experience and that have been successful in, in doing the right thing. I'd certainly be taking advice from, from people just like you have on stage. Uh, second, I would tell them four years goes faster than you think. And so a lot of people will try to hold you up and slow you down, especially no matter what you do in that in a, in a government agency, there's all kinds of bureaucrats that don't want to do anything or they don't want to take the risk. They just want to hold on to their jobs and they want to get go home at five o'clock. And, and by, by taking risk and by, by pushing the workload, a lot of them have to work a lot harder than eight to five and, and they, they have to take risks. And I would encourage him to take risks and, and not worry about the next election. Just focus on doing the right thing that's in front of them because we, we need people like him to, to be in the fight with us. Uh, Rob, I wanted to say something because I, was, I, was, I would be remiss when you asked me about the most important cases, I, I really just went blank. I would, I would say that the, the other case I should mention is the, the heartbeat bill because that bill literally since passed and we defended all the way to the US Supreme Court. We got a 90% win. We're probably gonna finish up the, the, the other 10% in the next few months and get a 100% win. That bill saves over 100 babies a month. And, uh, you know, if that was the only thing I ever worked on in my life, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting in heaven some of these babies that, that were born as a result of the bill that was passed by the Texas legislature, signed by the governor. And uh, they gave us the opportunity to go fight the fight and defend that. That was amazing to watch. <laughs> the, uh, the last question I'll ask, uh, and I'm going to start General uh, Rutledge with you. Uh, General Reyes next, and then uh, General Paxton to close. But as we also always do here at TPPF, as the happy warriors we are, we always look for the, the hope and the optimism. And so I wanted to ask uh, each of you, as well as just really expressing my gratitude and appreciation for your service and, and being in the fight for liberty. But, but looking ahead, you know, we, we've had some dark days behind us, but, um, but we're, we're looking forward now. What makes you optimistic about the future of this country? We live in the greatest country the world has ever known. When we look at our brave men and women, whether it's our law enforcement officers who put their lives on the line every single day, our veterans who have sacrificed, and the lessons that they bestow upon the young people in our states, and the willingness to fight that our young people have, in Arkansas, we've done incredible things just as Texas and Utah have. We are the most pro-life state in the United States of America for the second year in a row. It's okay to clap, you can catch up. <laughs> and it's because we support cases like 
the heartbeat bill that Ken talked about, and all of us are in this together. But we also are passing legislation. One piece that we passed was to ensure that every single day public school students will have a moment of silence after they recite the Pledge of Allegiance. This is a moment of silence to meditate, to be quiet, or to get prayer back in our public schools. We passed the Girls Act to prohibit biological males from playing in all-female sports. I'm wholeheartedly defending the SAFE Act, which says that adolescents cannot receive experimental tr gender transitioning medication and procedures. One of the plaintiffs in that case is a nine-year-old. Now tell me what nine-year-old can make that sort of decision. And so I am hopeful because we have good patriots that love America, that want to see our children grow up to be whatever they can be, and that we are going to fight, and that we are going to band together, we are going to find each other, that you are at breakfast just like this, getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday, one year after President Biden took office, and you said no more. No more. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to take back the White House. We're going to take back the U.S. House of Representatives. We're going to take back the United States Senate because we are going to take back the United States of America from the liberal left and the radical left. General Reyes, how did you wake up this morning optimistic and excited about the future of this country? What gives me hope? The United States Supreme Court. Absolutely. 2022 congressional midterm elections, a lot of hope, a lot of excitement. 2024, when we will retake the White House after a failed administration. And what gives me hope most every morning when I wake up uh, are interacting with great Americans like you all. The light that you give off and that you bring, again, is felt not just in America, but around the world. I've had the privilege to travel with Generals Rutledge and Paxton to many countries to do important work on behalf of Texas, Utah, Arkansas, and our country. Leslie and I were in Israel not too long ago working on uh, creating even stronger defense for that great ally of ours in the Middle East. Ken Paxton, many places, but I recall Ken being uh, meeting with the president of Colombia down in South America to attack the, the global epidemic of human trafficking. And while, ladies and gentlemen, the media and academic elites will try to tell you that America is not what it used to be, that the stars don't shine as brightly as they used to, and the stripes are not as bold as they once were. I am here to tell you, having been around the world, dealing with the poorest of the poor, with victims of uh, trafficking and, and some of the most vulnerable, that they still look at America as the great light to the world. My father, an immigrant, came to this country to escape a dictatorial regime. He came here to flee a dictator, and lo and behold, may he rest in peace. He would be so appalled that we have somebody who thinks he's a dictator in Washington, D.C. today. But l cases like the mandate case remind Joe Biden that no one, not even the President of the United States, is above the law. The rule of law and the light that the rule of law allows us to live every single day is what gives me hope and what gives hope to so many around the world. It's why they still want to come here because America, for our many flaws that we have, we know we're not perfect, is still a light on a hill to so many and provides tremendous hope. So God bless America, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, Rob, for having us. Appreciate you so much. I'll say. So Rob, General Paxton, tell us about yeah. your your uh, your hope, your vision for Texas and America. You know, I don't think I could do this job if I didn't believe that we had hope, and I, I believe I believe that God gave us uh, a purpose. I believe He gave this nation a purpose. I gave, he gave the state of Texas a great purpose. He great He gave Sean, you, and Leslie a purpose, and me a purpose. And I I, I believe in that purpose, and that it's an optimistic, hopeful purpose and future. And I also am optimistic because of our founding documents, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. 
and, and the rights that they lay out for us. We have the greatest founding document in the world. We have something to fight for. It's in writing. So many countries don't have that, but we have a place to go and say, here are our rights. And those rights are not from the government. They're from God. And then I'm optimistic because I truly see the optimism in, in, in the people of Texas and wanting to fight for freedom and, and the optimism and the, the ability uh, of the people on stage, Rob, like you and your leadership and the people at TPPF that I've watched fight for 20 years, the great fights that we've had in Texas to, to preserve freedom and the fights that, that Leslie and Sean and I have literally almost every day and, and the encouragement that I get from them in the, in the fight that I have is, look, when we're in this fight, we get attacked every day. And sometimes it, it is hard to get up and say, well, I want to do this again. I want to take another punch. But when you have, when you see other people like Sean and, and Leslie and, and TPPF in that fight, and the people in your audience, it, it's encouraging to me uh, when I'm taking punches to, to, to keep on going because I know there's a greater hope and there's, there is a victory ahead. And, and in the end, it's, it's not up to us. I truly believe that God empowers what he's going to empower. And, and it's our job to go out and do the fight and, and leave the results to him. So we are going to do, be great. Our country is great. If we stick together, as Benjamin Franklin once said, if, if, we, don't, if we don't hang together, we'll all hang alone. I truly believe we're at that moment in, in, our, in our history that, that we, have to, we have to fight together. We have to stand together. We have to do it with courage. And we have to lead people to stand up in courage, whether it's parents, whether it's local community groups, this is the time to stand up because if we do not stand up now, we will lose that, that freedom that, that our founders so deeply believe in. So thank you all for, for having me and, and thank you for hosting this. Uh, and I really appreciate, appreciate my friends who are so gifted and so amazing for coming and, and joining us today. Well, thank you, General Paxton. And I really, you know, I, I, I pray and will continue to pray that, that God blesses each of the work that General Rutledge, General Reyes, General Paxton, you, and your staff and your incredible team uh, continue to do, you know. And so I just want to thank you so much for what you're fighting for, for being here with us. And I want to ask everyone here in this audience to thank General Paxson, General Reyes, General Rutledge for being on the front line of the fight for liberty.